Well, outstanding. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for going and finding somebody that you don't know, introducing yourself. I really do hope that you're finding this is a place where strangers are becoming friends. I'm glad you guys are here. If this is your first time here, or maybe you haven't been with us for a few weeks, man, we are excited. We have been fascinated uh, by elephants the last several weeks. We've been learning some interesting things about elephants. Uh, and so in this series, we, we are learning some of the things really almost kind of from a manual on how, to, how do we train an elephant? Well, we're kind of reading a, a handbook a little bit. And as we do, we're learning that some of the things that an elephant trainer does to train these massive beasts to do miraculous things are some of the exact same things that the enemy wants to do to us to cause us to feel stuck or helpless. And in order to help us to get out of that point of feeling stuck, in order for us to get out of a situation where we feel helpless, where we can't affect change, we can't move forward, we're looking at the life of David, one of the heroes and, and one of the, the key uh, players in the Bible and the Old Testament. And we're learning some interesting things about him, uh, that, that even though uh, he is elevated and exalted as a king, as, as a man uh, that God said was a man after his own heart, uh, we're learning that David was just a dude. Just a dude who put his man dress on one arm at a time, just like you and I do. But what we're learning about David is that David went through some of the similar things that maybe you have gone through. And what we're doing is, is we're learning what is it that David did to either avoid getting stuck or what were the things that David did to help him get unstuck? And so in today's lesson, we're going to focus on this lesson that every trainer needs to know. And it is this, that you need to reward obedient behavior. Say that back to me. Reward obedient behavior. Here's the deal. Trainers will, will, will deploy what, what psychologists have called a positive stimuli when training an elephant. So when an elephant does uh, the right thing, they'll reward the elephant with snacks like grapes or apple slices or, or some sugary something uh, as, as an attaboy. And when they do the wrong thing, then they, they reinforce that with a negative stimuli. So sometimes elephants are massive animals, so you, know, you can't just slap them on the hand. So sometimes they'll kind of take a fist and like, hey, hello, don't do that. Uh, or sometimes they'll yank on their trunk, kind of get their attention a little bit. Um, so, so positive stimuli and, and negative stimuli. And the point is, is they want to get that elephant to the point of, of, of doing something that feels so mechanical, so robotic, that it just does it every single time and doesn't even think about it. And it knows it's going to get that positive stimuli. If you have a dog, if you have ever had a dog, you have likely done this. Right? You don't want the dog peeing all over the house. The first six months of having a puppy are literally the worst. When Jessica and I got our first puppy, we had been married six, six months. We were like, this will be great. We'll get, a, get a puppy. No. No. We still have furniture that doesn't look the same because it chewed it up. We lost the security deposit on that apartment. I mean... It was terrible. It was good training for, for parenthood, though. Uh, only two of my kids have chewed on the furniture, so that we're doing good. <laughs> so if you've had a dog, you've done this, you reward positive behavior with treats, you reward negative behavior maybe with a, with a newspaper rolled up, or you smack them, or you put some roof on the, the, the roof, the roof, peanut butter on the roof of their mouth, right? But, but here's the deal, if you are a parent, where's all the parents at? Parents, raise your hand. Hello. All right. As parents, we have to come, become like ninjas at this. Okay. I'm just thankful that like for most, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, my, my mom, I remember hearing my mom talking about how she would bribe me to do things. Right. Listen, I will bribe my kids all day long and I don't even feel bad about it. I'm just thankful now that psychologists have come up that they don't call it bribery anymore. They call it positive stimuli. I feel a lot better about my self-esteem, about my parenting. Right? Try to get my kids to eat dinner. Who wants cookies? Me! Get a happy plate and you can get cookies. Mm. Who wants cookies? Me! All you got to do, dude, is eat those three bites of food for the love of everything that is holy. Eat your beans, son! Listen, I'll go all the way with it. I'll, bust, I'll just start eating them in front of him. He'll be crying. I'm like, listen, dude, you can have a cookie. 
eat the three beans. <laughs> Sounds like your success rate's about as good as mine. <laughs> Positive stimuli, negative stimuli, but here's the deal. Ultimately, what, what we're talking about here is trying to reward obedient behavior. But here's the thing that's interesting about obedience. I, here's what I've learned. I've learned that obedience is relative. Obedience is relative to the person of authority or to the person whose affection we desire to earn, it's relative to what they say. So I can say one thing and ask you to do something and you can do it and, and do it obediently. And someone over here can ask you to do the opposite thing and you can respond to it and you can be obedient to them. But you can't be obedient to two opposite things at the same time. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. So the thing about obedience that we need to understand is that it's all relative by the person who is in a position of authority and they get to be the one who defines what obedience looks like. What are we talking about? Well, I, I want to help you see that, that ultimately the positive stimulus that comes from obedience helps to reinforce a certain attitude, action, or behavior. So when we feel like we have received some sort of a positive stimulus, our bodies just naturally, our mind just naturally, our soul just naturally says, that was good. I did this. I got that in return. And it begins to develop a pattern. The same is true with disobedience. When we disobey and we receive some sort of a negative stimulus, our bodies should naturally, the fight or flight response should naturally trigger something that goes, "Ooh, that was bad. I should not do that again. Now, if you're like me, you have a remarkable propensity to ignore that and keep doing stupid things. And so what happens is, is so oftentimes we make decisions off of the things that bring us that positive stimuli. Ultimately, what I want to help you see is that positive stimuli, it is so significant that we understand who is the one that defines obedience. Because the, the one who defines obedience, the level of authority that they have to bring long-term satisfaction to our soul and to our life should be the one that we choose to be obedient to. You see, what I'm talking about today and really the focus of our talk today is about sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that we do that is the opposite or in opposition to God. The Bible uh, in the Old Testament listed out the Ten Commandments. What's interesting is the Ten Commandments were never supposed to be something, a list of things that we should try to accomplish and do. No, the Ten Commandments are supposed to show us that on ten simple rules, we can't do it. If you've lied, you're out. If you've cheated, you're out. You ever murdered anybody? Okay, you're in. Then Jesus comes along and says, yeah, but if you've ever hated somebody, it's like committing murder. We're all out again. There's no other thing in our life that has the ability to radically alter the trajectory of our lives in sin. There's nothing else in our life that can debilitate us, that can wreck our homes, ruin our dreams, or crush our joy than sin. And here's the thing, oftentimes when we come to churches and, and, and we talk about sin, man, I, again, it's another one of those things that I feel like we, we, we have a tendency to be on one end of the perspective or the other. And a lot of times if you're here today, and I recognize there's, there's a number of people that are here today that, that maybe you don't come from a church tradition, you don't come from a church background, or, or maybe you grew up in church and at some point you decided, I don't really know about this whole church thing. They just seem like a bunch of judgmental, hypocritical, not very nice people that proclaim to love Jesus, yet somehow that hasn't, like, they haven't told their face that. Um, and so, they, they just, I, I, I'm out. Here's the deal. I'll admit that oftentimes when it comes to sin, we can have a tendency as, as, as Jesus people to, to really overdo it and become really strict and really harsh and, and come across as holier than thou and judgmental and con condemning. At the same time, we have, there are some who can come across like, it's all good, don't worry about it. Just keep doing what you're doing. You got Jesus, that's all you need. That's... True, but if we've got Jesus, then that should reorient and re redirect and change some of the things that we do. Amen. So when I'm coming to you to talk to you today about sin, I want you to understand it's because I love you. It's because I care about you. 
And whether you spend one week at our church or you spend forever in our church, listen, I just, you just need to know something today that it, it's necessary that we talk about sin in the church. Amen. And I just want to encourage you. Don't ever trust a pastor who doesn't love you enough to talk about your sin. And at the same time, don't ever follow a pastor who doesn't love you enough to teach you about grace. Amen. You see, we don't get to choose. It's, it's both and. We need to know about our sin and we need to know about grace and we need to understand how grace trumps our sin. And because of that, we should spend less time doing sinful things and more time pursuing the grace of God. And that process begins change in our hearts in our lives. As your pastor, I pray that you'll find that I'll always do my best to balance this. And the reason why is because I don't want your life to be destroyed and dismantled and be disoriented because of sin. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that it's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy's desire is to chew you up and spit you out. I've always found it fascinating that the, 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 the the rhythm that Jesus chose in talking about that, because in my mind, it would have made more sense to go to steal us, to destroy us, and then to kill us, because dying is the worst that there is. But Jesus intentionally didn't do that. He said, no, the enemy came to steal, to kill, and then to destroy, because there is something worse than dying. It's dying knowing that your life is being dismantled and destroyed, and you can't do anything about it. But Jesus says, I have come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. I want that life for me. I mean, you may not want that life for me, but I want that life for me, and I want that life for you. And so at some point, we've got to be willing to talk about the hard things, but we've got to be willing to address sin. So today I want to talk to you about two things, really. I want to talk to you about, about why sin happens, and I want to talk to you about how to find grace to get you past your past. And if you have your Bibles today, I want to invite you to open to the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to be in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 today. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We're going to put the verses on the screen. But we use them every time we get together. So I want to encourage you to bring it, uh, bring something to write with, highlight with, do it on your phone, whatever you got to do. And make sure you capture the things that God puts on your heart from his word. So in 2 Samuel 11, we get to a point where Saul is dead. King Saul is dead. David is now the king. He's been king for a little while now. And he has been kind of doing kingly type things. In the story that we're going to find in, in chapter 11 and verse 12, in chapter 12, we're going to see that the armies of Israel are out at war. Now, it was customary in those days that the king would always go to battle with his army. As the leader, he was oftentimes seen as the champion. He was oftentimes seen as the political leader. He was the, 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 uh, the legal leader. I mean, he was the guy. So the king would always go to war with his, with his troops to provide the encouragement and the support to know that he is there in support of them and his troops would often be willing to lay their lives down because their king was there. But in this particular story, in this particular story, season, David chooses not to go to war with his army. And instead, he chooses to stay home, which was a decision that proved to be very, very costly for him. He was sleeping one night, and you can track all of this in, in, in chapter 11. He was asleep one night, and he gets up. He starts to go on a stroll, and as he's kind of walking about the palace, he, he sees over kind of in the distance on, on, on a rooftop of another house, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. Now, listen, issue number one, homegirl should not have been bathing outside, all right? Like, let's just knock that out right there. But that doesn't provide an excuse for what David did. Now, here's what's interesting. If David would have looked and noticed her and go, huh, should probably not pursue that one and just keep walking, I want you to hear me, under, I want you to understand this, that would not have been sinful. Sin is not the moment where you notice or recognize something. Sin is the moment when you act on it. Amen. And so here's the deal. So David, instead of just walking on about his merry way, he goes and he sends one of his servants. He goes, hey, who that is? I mean, have you seen her? Why don't you go down there and figure out who that is? So then he sends the servants. The servants come back. 
And they basically tell him, uh, yeah, um, you know, this is, uh, this is Bathsheba, um, and she's married to one of your troops, hello, um, and he's actually at war right now, so that's who that is. Again, David could have avoided the situation by going, well, isn't that interesting? Now that I know that, I'll just carry on about my way. But the problem was he had already taken a step towards sin. And so oftentimes what happens in my life, when I take a step towards sin, it becomes that much easier to take the next step towards sin. So David sends for Bathsheba. She comes up. She spends time with the king. They sleep together. And then he sends her on her way. What I find interesting in the, 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 the narrative is in verse four, it says this. Then David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. Now, here's what's interesting about this. The fact that the Bible records that she was cleansed from her impurity implies that David must have asked what's going on here. What's, what's going on here is, 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 is she had begun her menstrual cycle and, and, and taking seven days to be cleansed from her impurity was not just good practice. Actually, it was in the, in the law in the book of Leviticus that a woman was to, was to spend seven days when her menstrual cycle began to allow all of that to process out so she could be clean again. And the Bible goes on to say in Leviticus 15 that any man who lays with a woman who is on her cycle shall be deemed unclean for a period of seven days. So here's what's interesting to me. David, in the midst of doing something sinful, he finds a way to posture it in, 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 in a way that he can still have the appearance of being spiritual. Hey, baby, how you doing? Yeah, before we get rolling here, I just got to ask, um, have you been cleansed from your impurity for seven days? then amen, hallelujah, let's go, right? Like David is in the process of trying to rationalize and spiritualize a sinful decision. Let me ask you a question today. Have you ever done that? Have you ever tried to rationalize something that you knew was wrong and you tried to paint it in some kind of way that sounded right or looked right or appeared right or seemed right? Well, I'm doing this because I've got I've got stress or I'm doing this because, you know, somebody said something or did something to me. You know, I'm just I just need a release. I need a, I need a break. I, I just need to whatever it is. Have you ever tried to rationalize sin with something that appeared spiritual? You see, that's what David's doing here. The text goes on to tell us that Bathsheba goes home. David continues being king. The men are still at war. Several weeks later, Bathsheba realizes, uh-oh. She sends news to King David. Uh, Hello, David. Um, you see, I'm pregnant, and my husband ain't been home. And well... You remember that one time when we did that one thing? It's like a Maury Povich show. You are the father. <laughs> David goes, oh, snap. This ain't good. You see, it's been a forever no-no that, that commanding officers don't sleep with the wives of his troops, especially when they are at war. So here's what David does. David goes, it's okay. I can cover this up. I can make this all right. Somebody send Uriah. Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. Somebody bring Uriah home. Uriah comes home. Oh, Uriah, what's going on, my man? It's so good to see you. How are things on the front lines of battle? Come, why don't you sit at my table? Why don't you eat my food? Please drink my wine. Oh, it's been so good to see you tonight, Uriah. Hey, man, you know what? You've been such a good soldier, and I thank you so much. Why don't you go home and why don't you go spend some time with your sweetheart? Uriah leaves, and the Bible tells us that Uriah sleeps on the welcome mat of the king's house. The next morning, the servants come and they tell David, Hey, David, uh, Uriah didn't ever leave the, the, the front door. David goes, well, that's not how that was supposed to work. 
He brings Uriah again. Second verse, same as the first. More food, more wine. Uriah, listen, my man, go do what married people do. Enjoy being home for a couple of days. You've been working hard. Yet even in a drunken state, Uriah has enough character to say, I cannot go do this thing. And enjoy the, the spoils of being at home when all of my friends and my brothers and my comrades are sleeping in tents on the front lines of the battle. David goes, dang it. Okay, plan B. He writes a note, gives it to you. He seals it, gives it to Uriah and says, hey, Uriah, I want you to give this to your commanding officer when you get back. Go on about your way. Thank you. God be with you. Uriah gets back to the front lines, hands the note to the commanding officer. The commanding officer opens it and he finds that the note says, hey, go to war today. Put Uriah on the front line of the battle. And when the battle is at its highest, hottest, most dangerous point, call all of the troop back, troops back so that Uriah is exposed and that he may be killed. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story of David, you're probably going, and this is the guy that the pastor wants us to learn from? Stick with me because we're going to learn some awesome things. So here's what happens. The commanding officer follows his king's orders, does exactly as told. They lose the battle. Uriah is killed. The commanding officer sends a messenger back to David. Hey, David. I want to let you know about what happened in the latest battle. We, we, were, we, were, we were in the thick of it, and it didn't go well, and we lost the battle. Also, it's important that you know that Uriah died. David isn't even mad about it. He's not even upset. When you actually read the text, it, it almost comes across like David's like, well, you know, you win some, you lose some. We'll get back on it tomorrow. News of her husband's death reaches Bathsheba, and she's understandably broken. And David orchestrates all of this so that he can do what was customary in those days. When one of his troops died in battle, it was not uncommon that the king would come and take that, that troop's wife as his own wife in order to take care of her, provide for her and his family. Now, we don't have time to get into today about all this, about David had multiple marriages. That's another message for another day. But what's important that you and I understand that it's really hard for us to fathom in 21st century America how they did things back in the Bronze Age, back in the day. I mean, way back in the day. But this was customary. And so David takes Bathsheba as his wife, and he is of the opinion, all is good. I got away with it. Bathsheba is now my wife. No one's going to think twice when she has a baby. Oh, just a little early. But see, here's the problem when it comes to sin. And here's the problem what happens when we try to cover it up. You may be able to fool everybody else. But you'll never fool God. And so much of the time, we spend so much time and energy and effort trying to hide, trying to cover up, trying to conceal our junk. That it's like somehow everything would fall apart if everybody could see the 8,000 pound gorilla that I carry on my back every day. And it's not an 8,000 pound gorilla of something that I don't like. I mean, there's parts of it I don't like, but it's a decision I continually choose to make. You see, here's what you need to understand. Our decisions of sin in a moment, it may, it may gratify our flesh in a moment, but it, it doesn't satisfy our soul. And, and we see this with David because once we get to the next chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 12, what happens is, is that there's several months that have passed between chapter 11 and chapter 12. We don't know exactly how long it was. We just know that by the time chapter 12 happens, Bathsheba has come to full term, delivered their baby, and David now has a beautiful baby boy. The other thing that we know is that the Bible doesn't record. David wrote, wrote all kinds of psalms. Matter of fact, the overwhelming majority of the, of, the, of the chapters in the book of Psalms in your Bible was written by King David. But the Bible does not give us any record that during this season, during this time, from the time that he sinned against Bathsheba and against Uriah to the time he did all the rest of it to what we're getting ready to read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David doesn't write a single psalm. I think that's interesting. I think it's enlightening. 
And I think it tells us something that you and I need to understand that if we have sin in our life, if we're actively pursuing sin, if we're actively covering up sin, listen, your soul will never be at rest. And listen to me, I talk to so many people that want to experience the blessings of God, the goodness of God, the the favor of God, while at the same time openly and defiantly sinning against Him and not taking the steps necessary to get that sin right before God. 2 Samuel chapter 12, there's a man named Nathan, he comes along. Nathan comes along. Well, let me back up a little. I'm getting ahead of myself. What are the, what are the three things that we need to learn about David right here? What, how, did, how did sin happen? Number one, David was idle. David was idle. He should have been at war, but he wasn't. Can I tell you that, that at least in my life, when I'm busy at work doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, can I tell you that I don't have much time to be drawn or appealed or lured by sin? So part of the problem here is that David was idle. He wasn't doing what he should have been doing. The second issue here is that David didn't heed the guardrail. What are guardrails for? Guardrails are so that we stay on the stinking road. In case the painted lines and the rumble strips weren't enough, every once in a while they'll put a guardrail off so that if you go way off the road, the guardrail will kind of sling you back into the road. The guardrail happened when the servants in verse 3, chapter 11, verse 3 says, And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Listen, when you're a servant, you don't tell the king nothing. But this servant, who is unnamed, loves his king. And by asking a question the way that he did, he's trying to help David see she's spoken for by Uriah who's at war, whom you sent there. You see, David didn't heed the guardrail. Number three, David allowed the moment. What is the moment? The moment for me and for you is any time that we allow temptation and opportunity to intersect. Any time that we allow temptation and opportunity to intersect, it creates a moment that in my experience never ends well. I never find that when I allow temptation and opportunity to intersect, that I don't get to a point where I make a really godly decision in that moment. I found in my life that I do best in staying away from sin and pursuing God when I, when I make sure, hey, temptation, okay, temptation is fine, but I'm not going to allow opportunity to come along with it. But if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a lot of things in life where we seek out opportunity when the moment of temptation comes along. David allowed the moment, and when you allow the moment, when I allow the moment, It doesn't really end well. So back to the text in verse 12. Nathan comes along. Nathan is a prophet of God. And this is what Nathan says. Several months have gone by. Keep that in mind. Shows up to David and it says this in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing. Except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now, if you were king or if you were queen and and someone came to you and told you this story, you would probably be a little ticked. That's not right. Why is this rich man who has so much going out of his way and taking from the poor man who has so little? Notice David's response. Verse 5. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David is outraged. I mean, he has 
blown a gasket. How dare this type of thing happen in my kingdom? I'm going to let my people know I won't stand for that. People are not going to misuse and abuse and mistreat people like that in my kingdom. Verse 7. The Nathan said to David, Hey, bro. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. And now God gets specific. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and you have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Wow. He fooled everybody. Months and months and months had gone by and nobody knew except him. And Bathsheba, and not even Bathsheba knew the extent of everything that David did. Yet there was still a stirring and a restlessness in his soul. And God shows up and calls him on the carpet and names his stuff specifically. took a long time but finally David for the first time after months of hiding and covering up and lying David finally admits out loud what he did verse 13 so David said to Sam or said to Nathan I have sinned against the Lord Can I tell you something? For many of us, getting to this point is like, a, is like, it just feels like it never happens. We buy the lie and we convince ourselves, if I just keep covering it up, if I just keep closing the blinds, if I just keep erasing the history, if I just keep going to different places, if I, if I don't allow anyone to see my phone records, if I just hide the books, if I just keep concealing and keep covering up, I can, I can control this. I can contain it. I can keep it all together and everything is okay. And in the meantime, while you're doing like this, your soul is doing like this. And can I tell you something? There's something profound. When you finally get to the moment where you admit out loud the sin you have committed against God. Now I want to dispel something here because for so many people that I've talked to that that maybe you haven't walked with God for a while, sometimes there's this belief, okay, all I got to do is just admit it. If I finally admit it, then everything's going to be okay and God will forgive me and everything's going to be good. And, and, and that's kind of true. God promises that when we admit and when we confess our sin, the thing that we have done, God's promise is eternal and unshakable. He absolutely will forgive you for your sin. It doesn't matter what you did. David's thinking, kill the dude. He, he had an, an affair with this dude's wife. He, con- he concealed it. He covered it up. He lied about it. He had a guy murdered. And then he went months con- covering and, and, and keeping this charade going. I'm going to be willing to bet you haven't done that. And even if you have, God's promise is still true that I will separate you from your sin as far as the east is from the west. But here's what, where we sometimes get it twisted. Sometimes we take the promises of God that are eternal in nature and we apply it to a moment in time. And sometimes there's this belief that if God will forgive me of my sin for all of eternity, then surely that means that he will also alleviate the consequences for my sin here and now. But God never makes that promise. You 
you will most likely still have to endure the physical consequence and ramification of the decision that you made to sin against God. But the hope and the encouragement is that when you get to the moment of confession and you bring it into the light, now my soul can finally rest in knowing that I am in the love of God. And come what may of those consequences, my God is with me. And the price he paid on Calvary means that I won't have to pay for this sin for all of eternity. So Nathan tells David, you're the man. David finally confesses it. Verse 13 goes on to say, Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. This is God's promise. When you confess your sin to him, you won't die eternally. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that anyone who would believe in him will never perish but have eternal life. But here's the physical consequence of David's sin. Verse 14, however, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departs from the house. That seems harsh. Maybe it is. Some of you would say, I, I, mm, mm -mm. I couldn't deal with that. Maybe you couldn't. But we have to see things from God's perspective. God knew that this baby, every day of its life, would be a walking symbol of the greatest embarrassment to the king of Israel, to the nation of Israel, and to the God of Israel. And because of that, would have given the enemies of the nation of Israel and the God of Israel opportunity to blaspheme the people, the king, and their God. And it may not seem like it, but this is actually an act of grace by God to alleviate this child from enduring that life. A living testament to King David that God's grace is real. And God orchestrating the situation so that the enemies of God will not have unnecessary reason to blaspheme him and to coax the nation of Israel into war because of it. For David, the physical consequence of his sin was the death of his child. And this illustrates a truth that you and I need to understand and that we need to allow to embed deep into our hearts. Does God want us to be happy? Yes. Does God want us to have joy? Absolutely. Does God want us to live a life that is abundant? Yes. But God never desires those things at the expense of our holiness. God is infinitely less concerned about your happiness as he is about your holiness. Why? Because if you belong to Jesus, you are a child of God, a joint heir of the king. You are an image barrier and a name carrier of the one true living God. And when you and I choose to sin against him, against his name, and that sin affects and impacts other people, it affects what he is trying to do to rescue, redeem, and save an entire universe and every person who lives in it. Does God want you to be happy? Yes, he does. But not nearly as much as he wants you to be holy and different and set apart because of his goodness and his grace. What can we learn from David here? Well, if you go to Psalm chapter 51, we don't have time to read it all today. I would encourage you this week, open the book of Psalm chapter 51 and read it. This is... 
A psalm that David wrote in direct response to this situation we've been reading about. And we don't have time to read the whole thing, but I want to highlight two verses for you that reveal something significant for you and us today, and then we'll close. Psalm 51 verses 16 and 17 says this. This is David crying out to God, and he says, after he's already talked about all of his mess, he gets to the end of it, and he cries out to God, and he says, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. And you do not delight in burnt offering. In David's day, the entire system of worship was built around animal sacrifices and and grain sacrifices and wave sacrifices and all of this stuff. And David is saying, listen, I am finally coming to the point of understanding that what is necessary to appease you is nothing I can do from the works of my hands. I can't earn your grace. I I can't earn your favor. I can't earn your forgiveness. I can't do enough sacrifices or burnt offerings. None of it will suffice for what I have done. And then he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You see, I believe that, that somebody in this place today that you've been walking in an area of sin in your life and it has been eating away at you. Perhaps somebody is here and you're literally watching your life be dismantled because of sin. There's some of you that are here and, and, and you know what this sin is and you've been trying all of your effort and all of your might to do what's right and, and, to, and to just uh, grip my teeth and willpower. I can do it. I can get there. Listen to me. Stop. You can't earn the grace of God. Stop hiding it. Stop lying about it. Stop concealing it. Stop covering it up. Stop trying to get over it on your own. Because God despises those things. But what God does not despise when it comes to sin in our life is a broken and contrite heart. When we finally come to grips with our sin, so much of the time, listen, maybe it's just me. When I finally come to grips with my sin, it's oftentimes because somebody called me on it or because I got found out. And my response then is a fear-based response out of the, what are the ripple effects? How is this going to affect my wife, my friends, my kids, my family? Hey, listen, can I tell you, pray for me because when I do, if I do something stupid, it doesn't just affect my family, it affects you. So I respond out of fear and and trying to backpedal and try to cover, manage the chaos and manage the storm and manage the consequences that are going to happen. But can I tell you, until we get to the point of having a broken and contrite heart because our sin has offended a holy God and because our sin, sin, sin sent Jesus to the cross to die a brutal death that I should have died, you're never going to get over it. Until you get to that point, you're never going to get over it. Your soul's never going to be at peace. Why is this so important? Because we are only focused on the consequences. If we're only focused on the consequences, we miss the heart of God. And we miss the grace of God. But this is the grace of God. And that while you We're still sinners. The lowest moment of your life, the worst moment of your life, the most humiliating, embarrassing, debilitating, shameful moment of your life. That is who Jesus died for. That's who he came for. That's what he saw when he hung on the cross and took his final breath and cried out to God, it is finished. The debt is paid. You don't have to get it all right. You don't have to get it cleaned up before you come to God. Listen, God isn't about cleanups. He's about transformation. 
Now, while we were still sinners, Christ died. Your sin was the reason He came. Your sin was the reason that He died. Your sin was the reason that He paid the ultimate sacrifice. And it is, it is His grace that gives us the ability to overcome and to be victorious and to be able to get to the point that we can find forgiveness and life beyond our sin. And when we get to the point of saying, listen, that stuff is in the past and my past doesn't get to define my future. I can get past my past with the grace of Jesus. So what does a broken and contrite heart look like? Because he didn't come to, to condemn us. He didn't come to bring us shame. You see, this is what a broken and contrite heart looks like. A broken and contrite heart is full of guilt, not shame. What do I mean by that? Guilt is a matter of fact that validates that something has been wronged, that a sin has been committed. Shame is a feeling that comes with feeling unworthy, embarrassed, or humiliated. Jesus didn't come to shame you, but he did come to convict you so that you can recognize how much you and I need him. A broken and contrite heart is full of conviction, not condemnation. Sorry, I got out of order. Conviction is that moment where we know we've done something wrong. Condemnation is the feeling you get when you feel that you have been condemned by others. See, God's desire is to convict you, not condemn you. To help you see your guilt, but never to bring shame. And ultimately, a broken and contrite heart is a heart that is open, not closed. What do I mean by that? I find it interesting that if you look in your Bible at the beginning of this chapter, there's this interesting little, little note there that it says that, that this is a psalm written by David given to the chief musician. Here's what's interesting about this. David writes Psalm 51. It's his lament. It's his cry of forgiveness and, and prayer of repentance to God. And he writes the psalm. And he could have kept it for his own personal journal, his own personal little, little book of stuff that he's written that he never shared with anybody. But David wrote the psalm and then went to the chief musician for all of the nation of Israel and said, here is this psalm, I'd like for you to read it. Imagine being the person who reads the greatest shame that the king has ever committed. The first one. Outside of God, outside of Nathan, the chief musician is the first one to learn about the nuances of the story. And I imagine the chief musician is like, that's really well written. Um, very melodic, melodic, whatever that word is. The chief musician probably would have known what that word was. It's obvious that I don't. Um, this is great, David. Oh, that's really good. It's, like, is this like shower singing or what, you know, what's going on here? David goes, no, I, I want you to take this and I want you to put music to it. And I want, I want the choir of Israel to sing this. Well, uh, my king, um, I mean, I'll do what you want me to do. But I mean, this was a long time ago now. And, you know, everyone's kind of moved on past this. Um. I'm worried, King, that if we do this, it's going to cause people to think less of you. And I mean, if you bring it into the open like this, I mean, what, what will people think? What will people say? What will you lose? What will it cost you? We don't know how the conversation went. But I believe that we know the heart of God and why David would have told the chief musician to take this. And you sing of my greatest shame. You shout my greatest sorrow. You let people know of my biggest mistake. Because what David knew and what David wanted the nation of Israel to know, that even though everyone else had gotten past it, David hadn't yet. And David had not yet had the opportunity to proclaim the glory to his God for his incredible grace. And what David knew is that the grace of God is bigger than my sin. That the love of God is so much stronger than the guilt that I feel. And 
the mercy of God is infinitely more vast than my past. You see, when we get to the point where we are truly broken and contrite, we don't care who knows. When you're drowning in a pool, you don't care how stupid you look. When you're calling out for help, you're just trying not to die. When you're drowning in a pool, you don't care who has the little dinghy. Just throw it, please. I'm dying. I'm drowning. I need help. And what I want you to see today from the heart of God is that God says in his word that the wages of our sin is death. We are dying. Without Christ, you are hopeless. Without Christ, we are done for. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. A broken and contrite heart says, I don't care who knows what, I just know I need Jesus. I'm done with this. I'm done with shame. I'm done with, with all this condemnation. I'm done with hiding and concealing. I don't care who knows it because I need Jesus because I'm done with this life and I want so much more. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know my Jesus and you've never experienced the type of hope and grace and mercy that comes when you call on his name for salvation, huh, It'll change your life and you will never be the same. And if you know Christ today and you know that to be true, you need to tell somebody today by clapping your hands or shouting amen and let somebody in the house know today that if they don't know Christ, they're missing it. You see, here's what that elephant trainer knows. He knows to reward obedience with a positive stimulus. What the elephant doesn't know is every time it takes steps towards Obedience is falling more and more into captivity. And every mindless step towards obedience, towards the opposite direction of what God intended and created him for, is a step away from freedom and a step towards captivity. And what the enemy does in our life, well, he will reward our sin with short-term gratification. But listen to me, the sinful decision in a moment may gratify your flesh, but it will never satisfy your soul. So today, if you don't know Christ, may today be the day where you say yes to him. We're going to have people on the sides of the room. We would love nothing more than to help you see Jesus. And if you're here today and you belong to Christ and you've been, you've been doing what David did, hiding and concealing and lying and covering up, I imagine right now your heart's probably beating a little faster. I imagine right now your ears are feeling a little red. And I imagine right now you're rationalizing. He's not talking to me. He's not talking to me. He's not talking to me. It's not a big deal. It's not a big thing. Nobody knows yet. Nobody's being hurt by it. It's no big deal. Hey, listen, I want you to understand that's not the voice of Jernigan, your pastor. That's the voice of the Spirit of God saying, would you come? Would you come and let me take that burden from you? Would you come and let me replace that thing that gratifies you in a moment with something that can satisfy you forever? Would you come before it falls apart? Would you come before everything dismantles? Would you come before your hopes and your dreams and your future is crushed? Would you come before your family is, is broken apart? Would you come? And would you bring it into the open? One of the jobs of the body of Christ is to pray with and to pray for one another. And I know we're still getting to know each other. You don't have to share all the details. You need to share it with somebody. But if that's you today, do not allow the enemy to reward your obedient behavior of sitting there.
and in so doing, taking another step towards captivity. May you today say, today is the day where I step towards freedom and I step towards grace and I step towards mercy and I experience the fullness of the beauty of the grace of Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Lord, we love you today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for David. Thank you that he wasn't perfect. There's so much hope for us because of that. Lord, I pray today for the person who's here that doesn't know you. That's going to end for somebody today. Because today somebody is going to walk from death to life in Christ. I pray they'd have the faith to step out and allow us to walk with them. And Lord, I pray for the person today that's here. That's walking and living in sin. Nobody knows about it but them and you. I pray today, Jesus, that they would find rest for their soul by finally admitting out loud that they are sinning against you. And in so doing, would they find grace, would they find mercy, and would they find this to be a place that is not full of condemnation but grace? full of people who are imperfect, who need Jesus just as much as they do, that are willing to come alongside of them and walk with them through this journey. But we ask in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand and would you sing with us?